So. I'm advocate Anjali Pawar. I uh, completed my gradu uh, post graduation in uh, master in social work, and after that, I completed my graduation in uh, law also. And uh, working in this field since 1998 as a child rights activist and uh, working on child protection issues and women's issues. I'm Arun Dola, and I was actually adopted from Pune, from India, in 1973. And I actually wanted to search for my roots when I was 14, but of course we couldn't, <laughs> it was not possible. And I started searching for my roots when I was around 20 in 1993 and went for the first time to India. I went through my orphanage and I made the experience most of the adoptees do <laughs> make. They were not helpful, it was the opposite. They were telling me there is no, there is no, there are no records. So when there are no records, I didn't know what to do, so I thought that was it. Yeah. Uh, during uh, when I was working with uh, children's issues, uh, I also worked with uh, Quality Institutional Care and Alternatives Campaign, which was working on uh, residential care institutions with Department of Women and Child Development. And that's how I started connecting with all these adoption agencies because we were talking about alternatives. And when these alternatives issues started coming up and I started going deep into adoption issue and adoption agencies, I started realizing there is something. And in 2006, this uh, CNN and I been exposed adoption scandal of Prith Mandir. And as we were aware, something is happening, but we were not having proofs about that. And uh, CNN came up with some proofs and all. And we started working on that issue. And that's how first time I met Arun because Arun was also working on that and uh, we started together working on these adoption issues and uh, first we filed uh, one criminal writ petition in Bombay High Court later on uh, being behalf of my organization we also filed one uh, writ petition in the Bombay High Court and that's how uh, all this uh, exchange of documents and material that started happening and Arun was also having a lot of uh, things with him and uh, after seeing that, uh, I was the person who was actually promoting adoption that time when we were talking about alternatives. But after going deep into these adoption issues, I started realizing it's not good. We need to think about it while before doing it and stop because you don't know what child you are taking and if it's snatched from one vulnerable mother or not. I started because I had in the meantime actually started looking deeper into what adoption is and how the background of adoption is, what, what happens behind the facade of adoption, I knew the practices are doubtful. So I started getting connected actually to women and child rights activists in India and who were fighting the really outright buying and selling of babies from the Lambada tribe in Andhra Pradesh and their contact network you know, still helps me and us today. And these people connected me to a lawyer, Pradeep Hafnur, who is still my friend, or became my friend. And I filed a case, a criminal case, against the state. First, we made a police complaint. And, no, let me say it differently. First, first Pradeep and me actually for th three weeks Every day met in the evening and we studied the laws surrounding adoptions and surrounding this whole yeah, inter-country adoption thing and the Guardians and Wards Act and Hindu Adoptions and Madness Act and the CARA guidelines and the Supreme Court case and everything. So we studied everything and we came out with the, uh, with the conclusion that the best is to file a criminal case against the orphanage because there was no relinquishment document. So we filed a police complaint against the orphanage and then because the police didn't take up the investigation obviously we sued the police so i lost that case in the high court that goes king went rather fast i lost the case also because the bombay high court is itself very deeply involved in adoptions and the agencies actually when they give children into adoption they have these hearings in camera so i lost the case it was dismissed also with the argument that of course the privacy of the mother has to be respected. Then I got stuck in the Supreme Court because we appealed that case and I got stuck with my life actually in a seven years court procedure. And 
During that time, I started realizing something is really wrong with adoption <coughs> and the, the inter-country adoption practices. And I started parents in India whose children were stolen and kidnapped <coughs> for adoption to help them. And I started also researching the Preet Mandir practices. And that's then later how Anjali and me met. That's a long off, long off story. But I want to make clear that I did not um, work on searches. So this was not my, my driving force in the sense of that I wanted to help adoptees. I wanted to help the parents whose children were missing and not those and to expose those current practices. So I was not about the practices 30 years ago. I'm speaking here about what's happening or at that time was happening right now. <clears throat> so this did not make me many friends globally all over the world because we were exposing that this is child trafficking and sometimes done without right crimes. Like Anjali said, we filed in our contact, my, my other friend Sangeeta, we filed a court case against Preet Mandir and the scandal actually got picked up by Danish media, by Indian media and the scandal in Chennai got picked up by the Dutch media. So there was a whole documentary series made about these kidnapped children from Malaysian social service. And there was a whole investigation done in the Netherlands about this and covered up. And because of this debate in 2007 about whether adoption or inter-country adoption should continue like that, we, you know, I met Ruli Post and our founder, because she was always invited as the expert in the TV shows. It's actually Hilbrand Vestra who brought me and Ruli Post together. And, um, you know, I was actually cooperating and giving the United Adoptees International a lot of information about the current practices. So this is how me and Rudy met. And then we actually started an act and we did a lot of in-depth investigations, but this is a different topic, but this is how ACT actually came into, into existence. And because I'm adopted, I can never say no to an adoptee who wants to find his or her roots. I got access to my file in 2010 by the Supreme Court, and I found my mother a little later. Well, Anjali better traced it. It's a long story. Um, what I want to say is that in the beginning, of course, I helped adoptees just like that. Some, the first case is actually just an adoptee asking me to send pictures. And I did so while I was in Pune, so that was easy. And I accompanied also adoptees and we filed court cases. And I will explain now the court cases we actually fought, what, what's work been done. And I've just helped adoptees from my heart, but you know, if you if you have more adoptees, you can't, you, you have to set up something structurally. And I will explain now, uh, I will explain now the court cases actually, which we fought speci with specific uh, relation to adoptee rights. This meeting or this online presentation is also a response to one of the posts post Rajini actually made. And she suggests or asks why adoptees cannot just go to a lawyer, 10 adoptees together or five and then share the costs and then you actually get the information. Because I understand that, of course, Rajini filed a court case and she did the same, so the lawyer did the same as we did. The lawyer did actually really good work. Rajini actually filed a police complaint and then they went to the high court and the court issued notices to the police and the police actually went to the orphanage and got the information. So that's so easy. That's what I also thought oh, we hoped for. It's not that easy. So we have been actually litigating since many years. And I want to explain what we did, what pre-work we, we, we have done. And of course, everybody is free to just go to a lawyer and try it out. But just let's let me at least explain what we did. So my case was the first case of an adult adoptee who actually went to court. We chose a criminal procedure because of the argument of the privacy of the mother. So that's the biggest argument, the privacy of the unmarried mothers. 
As I said, my case was dismissed by the Bombay High Court and then it went to the Supreme Court. And once you're stuck in the Supreme Court, you need top-notch lawyers. And when you litigate, also with all respect to the legal fraternity, I actually flew every time to India. And it meant sometimes that I got a message on Saturday that on Tuesday my case is coming up. So I flew to Delhi. <laughs> and then I was on Tuesday I was, was in Delhi with my lawyers. I actually had to fly my lawyer in Bombay to Delhi. And uh, we also need, in the Supreme Court, you need top-notch lawyers. I was lucky that I had pro bono senior counsels like Harish Salve, Rajiv Dutter, Mr. Nafde, absolutely top-notch lawyers who you normally cannot pay, who actually represented me in the court. Because if you're in the Supreme Court and you lose, you're done, it's finished. Above the Supreme Court, there's only God. So only praying helps then. But it happens also that I flew from Germany to India, flew everybody to the court in the Supreme Court, paid all the expenses, by the way, of course, and, you know, then the case doesn't come up. <laughs> it comes up next week, so you have to do it again. Or it comes up three months later. So, it is really, you hang in the court. So I do not wish this to happen to any LOT. And it can happen to you or to a group of LOTs who are actually going to court, to the High Court. And as I said, the Bombay High Court hasn't been really helpful. And the Delhi High Court most likely will also not be so helpful for the adoptees. And in South India, probably also not. Specifically not in cases of unmarried mothers. And I will explain later why when I explain the laws. <coughs> what happened in my case is in the Supreme Court at the end, actually showed me the file in the open court. The next case, <coughs> which, we, which we worked on specifically regarding adoptee rights, apart from the Preet case, was the case of Jaya Maria Shup. So Jaya Maria Shup was actually adopted from the same orphanage as my sister. And I found my um, adoptive sister. So Jaya is adopted from the same orphanage as my adoptive sister, Eva. And with a lot of pressure, of good contacts, I got actually access to the file of Nirmala Social Welfare Center in Ulal. And that was 2004 and my sister didn't want to search. But through this, somehow, because Chaya was also there, or earlier we met later. So I tried to help Chaya and I drafted the petition for Chaya. I went through my lawyer, of course. And then we found her a lawyer in Bangalore who has been fight, fighting the case and one of our other contact person has also been taking um, up the case. So that's why you don't find my name in this, but I coordinated that. So in China's case, we, the problem was she's not from an unmarried mother, she's from a single mother. And the problem was that the orphanage says they don't have a file and they were really surely saying that and it might be true. It was a very weird adoption procedure. And we got that far that the, the court ordered the police to actually raid the orphanage. Then they couldn't find anything. Then we got argued again. And then Chaya herself, with our so other social worker, actually could go to the orphanage and search. In Chaya's case, ultimately the court dismissed the case as well. And we went on a true appeal again. So then again, the police searched for Chaya's records and couldn't find anything. In this court order, so this is Jaya's case, Maria Jaya Shub. So the case, we fought this case five years. I mean, no, let's be clear, this is not just like this. It's not like it happened in Rajini's case, that it is always like this. So in Jaya's case, we fought five years. And at the end of the day, the court came actually out with a very good court order, which actually gives us adoptees the rights. <coughs> this was a very good court order. I also have to say, if I see, speak about adoptee rights, that of course in 1984, we already, ha since 1984, from the 1984 Supreme Court judgment, we actually, or more precisely, the adoptive parents have the right to have that information. That sadly has never been followed, so that's a problem. The next case is a very interesting case, because, you know, Ah, here it is, here it is. It's a case, oh no, that's, uh, where is this? 
are here. No, yeah, it's this, why do I have to fight for my mother? It's a Dutch adoptee who was adopted from Balanand and came originally from Shadanand Mahila Ashram. And we, I came in contact actually with Daksha during the presentation of uh, Pien Boss, who defended her PhD thesis. And Ruli, our founder, had actually been already talking to, to Ina Hood. And Ina Hood actually asked me, she had met Daksha in Bombay when she was trying to search and got stalled by the orphanages. So Daksha, um, so there she had met Ina and Ina had actually promised Daksha to help her. So what Ina did when I met her, she asked me, Arun, how can you help me convince Sulu to help the adoptees? I said, you can't, you may have to sue her. And I have to very clearly see, we don't need to sue Sulu anymore or anything. So just to be clear. So what, but at that time it was like that. So at that time in 2008, it was in the beginning 2008, Ina asked me, okay, you speak to Pauline Hill. Pauline Hill is the Roots and Program Manager of Verelt Kinderen. I went outside, we were nicely smoking cigarettes at that time, and had a sick cigarette outside, and started talking. And I said, your files are wrong, you are trafficking in children. And she said, if it's like that, then we have to take responsibility. And from that moment on, we were actually talking about three, four hours a day, after Pauline's working time in the middle of the night from 12 to 5, 4 o'clock in the morning and exchanging information. And then I really volunteered and Anjali too and we traveled together with Pauline and the, roots, uh, and the adoption manager even to India. And we actually took up, you know, um, the case of Monisha, for example, which Anjali solved. But we also took up the case of Daksha and we went together, I mean, to. We were in India and Pauline went, was treated like the adoptees are treated, you know, like it's a rubber war. So after I think 10 days, um, you know, we couldn't get any further. And then the next step, Pauline Hillen actually invited, Verelt Kinderen invited my friend and lawyer Pradeep Hafnur to the Netherlands and we actually agreed to fight a court case. So we, Ina Hood, actually at that time, filed a police complaint specifically against Shadaranand Mahila Ashram. Since that police complaint wasn't taken up, we filed a high court case. Unfortunately, at that time, Ina Hood had left Verelt Kindren, left us hanging also, and had uh, Albert Yap actually didn't want to fight a court case. So Albert Yap von Sandbrink, who was the successor of Ina Hood, didn't want to fight for LOT rights. He became later Terra de Zom uh, director, by the way. So we were stuck with the court case. And okay, Verel Kinderen had paid our lawyer beforehand. So we said, we will continue it nevertheless on our expenses. And uh, we lost. We lost in the high court. The case was dismissed, though giving us the opportunity to go to another court or to go to appeal. So this was not completely over. But the adoptee, for understandable reason and for, for, for all kinds, didn't, was so baffled she didn't want to continue to fight at that point of time. So we were left with that case. Um, it's also something you have to consider if you go to court, you have to be ready to go to Supreme Court. Because we are dealing here with a legal system which is a common law system. So any court order is like law. So if you, get, if you have a win, then okay, the next one can actually use that court order, you know, to say, but if this is the law, you should do this and this. If you lose, then we are all damaged. It's very important to, 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 to understand why I'm sometimes getting so upset when somebody says, oh, I will just go to court and request my file. And I say, if the court denies you, we will all, our work will be stopped and we will all again have to fight. So this is why I'm so nervous about it, because it's a very thin ice. The next case which came, and you also have to understand, I mean, you also have to understand, you don't need to go any, every time to court. That's not necessary. So once, 
once one LP has one or one case is one, you can use this case unless somebody else gets a negative order. So this is why I'm saying, you know, be careful. We won. I will explain that. So the next case we fought is the case of Sao Domini. This is a very, very sad case. This is a very, very sad case. I would also really like to mention that she paid all the expenses. She paid a hell of a lot of money. We did the same thing like in Daksha's case. We repeated it. Like also the same thing Rajini actually has done, or Rajini's lawyer. We filed a police complaint and we went to court. And at the end of the day, the court put her down and then left the door open that we could go again, like in Daksha's case, to another court, to a lower court. We had to actually go to the high court because the high court actually agreed to the adoption. So we couldn't have gone through the lower court in the first place. And then we went through the lower court. It was a constant fight with the police because the police was actually going to the orphanage and the orphanage was saying everything is fine. And the police said, yeah, we don't, we don't go further. Why? Because of course on the board of the orphanage is a retired director general of the police. So you're fighting very, very high, high level organizations here. And at the end, at the very end, you know, we got with the help, help of the uh, Women and Child Development Department and one of the very good social workers there, we got the file. Based on that file, the police actually tried to search for Saudamini's mother, but they were not knowing how to do it. And then the court requested Anjali to actually trace the mother. Anjali traced the mother. As I said before, I was very concerned about the inter-country adoption system. And we found many cases of outright trafficking. And um, also the old cases, I mean, where I helped people um, to reunite with the families or where I was involved. I was, for example, involved in tracing back the family, the Indian mother of David Smolos' children. Because I was kind of the in-between between the social activist in Andhra Pradesh and the, and the Smolans. I also had, in the case of Julia Rowling, I was the one tracing back, or at least getting access to the files and tra tracing the name of the mother and in the beginning of the search I was involved. And so what, what, I, did, what, I, what I did was drafting a petition um, in, um, for the Supreme Court. So collecting all the materials and all the evidences which, which we had and compiling them all the cases and everything. So I drafted this petition and it was filed by Saki, which is Anjali, and um, Advait Foundation. <laughs> so it was filed in the Supreme Court. And again, this is a huge process because we had to compile it, had to draft it. Then, you know, it went through lawyers. It's not that I'm a lawyer, I'm not. And don't know, the lawyers made it better. And then you have to actually as I said before, you need a senior counsel who actually appears because you don't want to take a risk, you want the best of the best. And you know, the senior counsels, you have to meet with them and they actually they slice you in, uh, in slices because they have to argue your case. So <laughs> I was sitting there and you know, they were just saying, I need this, where's this? What? Very tough work. But at the end, we start. We start filed it. In this case, it's significant for adoptee rights as well because there was, of course, one paragraph about adoptee rights. What we actually requested the Supreme Court was to put a moratorium on intercountry adoptions and, of course, to set up something proper for, so that adoptees are being assisted. I made a strategic mistake because I thought there will be no new adoption law. And in 2015, unfortunately, Manika Gandhi just got through the new Juvenile Justice Act. And so at the end, our case was kind of obsolete. Because my argument was moratorium until a new law that's there, or our argument. As, as far as the adoptee rights are concerned, we, we, because Kara was, of course, uh, a party to that case, we had the opportunity during this court case, of course, through the court, comment on the CARA guidelines. So just in short, 
because of our efforts, the court cases we fought, at least CARA had in 2000 <coughs> had to acknowledge the rights of the adoptees that we actually have the right to know. <coughs> now, on the other hand, the adoption agencies were very upset with that. So what they got into the CARA guidelines was a third party clause. So it was actually the Federation of Bombay Adoption Agencies most likely, or definitely, who actually got that clause in that third party searches were not allowed. So that we were essentially banned or barred from doing searches. We got in, was right <laughs> for the adoptees and that the authorities actually have to assist the adoptees. So that's a big thing. <coughs> and um, the other part of that, which I also want to be very clear about, we asked the United Adoptees and actually Anjali came from India to the Netherlands and we met with Anand Kappa and we met with the uh, yeah, then the UAE board, we met with Hilbrand and we asked, because this case was not really just about adoptee rights, so we, we, we asked the UAE as an organization to intervene in that case and become a party. I offered them to, to cover all the expenses and actually also ensure that they have a separate senior counsel for free. So, you know, when we're talking about a class action suit or something, I asked the UAE to do it and I actually said I'm going to try it, that the resources are there. So the UAE agreed, but then some people, it was, it fell through, there was no time. It's a typical rubber, where, rubber wall which was there. So um, please understand that if I'm on social media upset, there's a reason because I was left hanging by those people who are saying now maybe we should go to court. And who were saying earlier, oh, Arun goes always to court, that's a bad thing. Essentially, um, through our efforts, the adoptees' rights are now in part, not yet perfectly, enshrined in the CARA guideline adoption rules. And one has to understand that it was a new law in 2015, CARA became a statutory body. So CARA, actually, the adoption rules are not just mere guidelines anymore, they're really binding. So if anybody tries to challenge those guidelines in the court, they will likely you lose because it's the law. So let's have a look what the law says. On the CARA guide website, there's of course the option regulations 2017. So I don't go into very much into this. But what I want to show is one thing. Many relinquishment documents, and even today, so before I explain the law, I will show how relinquishment documents look like. How to find it? Deed of surrender. So deed of surrender, it is called. And earlier, specifically the Bombay agencies and also the Delhi agencies, they were making the mother they were making statements and because I'm unmarried, I did not want to disclose my identity. So that's already a request for confidentiality. So also the Bombay agencies, you know, I request my case, uh, I request confidentiality. Something was there, is always there in these relinquishment documents, which at the time the mothers and their families, of course, wanted confidentiality. Here I'm speaking specifically about unmarried mothers. So the relinquishment documents as today, yeah, have this clause here. I wish, do not wish my, our identity and address to be disclosed to my, our child when she returns for root search. So this is the current relinquishment documents. So all the current children who go for adoption in India or abroad will be blocked by this clause. And I show why. In case of an orphan or abandoned child, information about his adoption including the source and circumstances in which the child was admitted into the adoption agency, as well as the process followed for his adoption may be disclosed to the adoptee by the specialized adoption agency or the child welfare committee, as the case may be. In case, and you know, for the old cases, there is no child welfare committee involved. So there's child welfare committee is not uh, going to help you much as adoptees because they, don't, they only have powers to deal with children, minors. In cases of root search by all adoptees, the agencies or authorities concerned, 
authorized foreign adoption agency, central authority, Indian diplomatic mission, authority, state adoption resource agency, or district child protection unit, or even the, or the adoption agency, whenever contacted by an adoptee, shall facilitate his rules choice. So this is brilliant. And I explained this already in 2017. <coughs> um, persons above 18 can apply independently online where children below 18 years shall apply jointly with their adoptive parents to the authority seeking facilitation of the root search. You can also write directly to CARA and they should facilitate your root search. But we all know it doesn't really function. Here comes. That's why I showed the surrender lead. If the, sur if the, if, uh, if the biological parent at the time of surrender of the child have specifically requested anonymity, then the consent and writing of the biological parents shall be taken by the specialized adoption agency or child welfare committee, as the case may be, before divulging information. In case of denial, no? and this is important, this is why we also do not give the name and address of the unmarried mothers or parents before we actually haven't traced them. We don't do this. So this is we really follow the law. If, if the biological parents, yeah, that is what I said, in case of denial by the biological parent, all the parents are not traceable in surrendered cases, the reasons and the circumstances under which the information is not being made available shall be disclosed to the adoptee. So now you have to imagine an adoption agency who, who they don't really know how to deal with unwed mothers and how to approach them. So if an adoption agency searches for your mother and they go, I overdo it a little bit on purpose, hey, your child wants to find you, your secret child, do you want to meet it? The mother will be like this. And the mothers, when we contact the mothers or when Anjali contact the mothers, they're most of the time like, oh, scared. So that's the first reaction. So when the agency now puts on your file <laughs> that actually the mother request does not want contact, then you are done. You can go to the Supreme Court because that's the law, you are done. The Supreme Court will also say privacy of the mother should be protected because that's the right. That's the next sentence. Seven, the right of an adopted child shall not infringe the right to privacy of the biological parents. So you are done, you are done. that's the law. We may not be agreeing with this, but in fact, I have to say, given the social circumstances in India, I'm very scared of an Dutch adoptee. We are seeing now Dutch adoptees doing that, and putting the information, or Italian adoptees, we can see that, you know, putting the information of the unmarried mother out on Facebook groups. I, Anjali will explain more about that, so that, that, that really, you know, like, wow. And um, here, this was always our problem. If you remember who was actually there in 2018, then you, I explained this already. So a root search by a third party shall not be permitted, and the agencies or authorities concerned shall not make any information public relating to biological parents, adoptive parents or the adopted child. So we were not allowed, right? We didn't bother about that, because we always take a power of attorney, which, also, which makes us the representative of the adoptees. With the power of attorney, you actually become like the adoptee, and the adoptee is allowed to search, right? So we were actually rather successful in solving cases between 2013 <laughs> till, unfortunately, beginning 2017. And then we got slowly stuck, because the department did not help us in the root searches. There's one reason also for that, because some adoptee, we know him all, went to Kara and tried to get his file from Shodanat Mahila Ashram. And Kara did this inspection together with the local department here and told the, and they actually got the file and, they, and um, then Kara said, yeah, the mother requested anonymity or confidentiality. So the adoptee got blocked and Kara told the department, who was earlier helping us, no, you cannot help those, you cannot help work or collaborate with Anjali and, because she is the third party. And since that time, around that time, we are got 
got stuck because then it was on the high level of the department where we got blocked. So in 2017, 18, on the cases which we had in Maharashtra got blocked and we started communicating with the authorities and building a file. Building a file very carefully. We also tried to speak to authorities and we tried to speak to Kara as well. And um, Kara was very clear, we, we are going to stop your work. I was invited on, you know, I showed the picture last time. I was invited to give a training for high court judges. And there Kara really declared war to me and said, we, we are going to stop your work. So we had a real trouble. And I'm thanking all the adoptees who have actually been contributing to the Adoptee Solidarity Fund because that's actually what made us, made, made us able to file another case. So we prepared, which actually took two years to prepare that case, something like two years, no? Yeah, so it took around two, more, two years and then we prepared the case. We did not make this case about whether the adoptee right goes over the unmarried mother's case right. We made that case only about that fact that when we have a power of attorney, we are representing, we, or Anjali, when Anjali has a power of attorney, that she's representing the adoptee and that the no authority can then say, or no orphanage can say no to her based on the argument that she is a third party. And we won this case. We actually took, because you know, when you, when you talk about class action suits, you know, it's, it's, all the cases are different. And you don't need 100 people. It doesn't make a difference if you have 100 people filing. So what we took is we took the strongest case, which we had, and filed that in court. But because we had on all the other cases already written to the authorities, when we won this case, we are getting the other cases through. That's it effect of setting a precedence. So we won this case and um, essentially, where, where is this? Go, no, we complete document. Yeah, we won this case and this is the absolute win for adoptee rights because it means now you can appoint people in India to actually represent you. You can Obviously, find somebody on Facebook and ask him to become your representative and then he can do the search and the, the, the trying to find your parents. Yeah, it's not became representative, it's became you. Yeah, it's like yeah, you, can appoint, you can appoint somebody with a power of attorney and the, your power of attorney holder is like you. So you can actually go to the authorities and demand the records and everything. And that's what we are doing. That's a secret. And we have, this is a maximum win we can currently get. So the court actually allowed Anjali Pavar to be your represent, your, to be you. You can appoint her as a power of attorney and the authorities have to cooperate with her. Of course, when I say you can find some lay person on Facebook, that's theoretically possible, but you still have to convince the government authorities that they actually cooperate with you. The, the mindset of the government authorities is like that that if you, if you violate or um, if you actually, you know, if you actually harm an Indian woman, an Indian mother, then her whole family will be in distress. The whole family, the children, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles. And so authorities are not so keen on, you know, putting adoptee rights over the rights of the mothers because they know you travel back to the Netherlands and then you will have your life and that family's life will be destroyed. So you have to, you represent it, you're, you're, the person you appoint actually has to be able to convince the authorities and then also authorities in India are not so easy to deal with so it's not like you write a letter you get an answer with the information. So you know even though we won the court case in 2018 in some of the cases we are still waiting for the identifying information. So it's not that easy. So <laughs> No, we won the case in 2019, sorry. We won the case in 2019 and still, in some cases, we are still waiting for the identifying information. It's not that easy. But we won for adoptee rights 100% and we have the precedence actually that Anjali can 
get all informations from actually all orphanages over, over India with that precedence. And secondly, we also have, um, because we won that, the orphanages actually collaborate with us. Even, we were, uh, even though we were having uh, this power up attorney issue, before that also, uh, I can able to convince the authorities with our cases, with our experience and even uh, many of the adoptees who found out their families with us, they also met the authorities. So they were knowing that we are doing this and we are doing it carefully. My experience and my previous work in child rights sector and uh, as I am an activist, I am not general social worker or who is just doing some kind of social work. I'm activist, so and uh, my name is Bawa too. So they know if they are going to fight me, it is going to hard with them as well, because I'm working with their department and issues within the residential care institutions and regarding children. So they know that uh, I'm not going to do anything wrong, which will harm the admin brothers. So it is. Uh, it's, we convinced always the authorities. Very, very clear. We want almost fully. We can't get it better. We can't get it better because of the adoption regulations 2017, who actually uh, limit or uh, limit the rights of the adoptees when it starts infringing on the rights of the to privacy of the mothers. If anybody goes to court, there is a huge risk that we are going, this is going to be reversed. And that's why I'm really afraid for. So if somebody goes on the Facebook page and says, hey, let's just go hire a lawyer and do it, without understanding actually the background, it might just fire back and the door we are just opened, maybe just shut. For us, for our cases, and for each and everybody of you. So this is why I'm worried and nervous about it. The, um, there's absolutely no need to file any further court case. So, with the power of attorney, anybody can go through the authorities, demand that information. At the same time, of course, you have to make sure that this person is able to convince the authorities that the life of the mother will not be spoiled. So, if we have organizations who are publishing, um, you know, search videos of adoptees with unmarried mothers, cases. I'm not sure whether such organizations will be able to convince authorities that they're not going to spoil the unmarried mother's life when they've already proven that they don't respect it, that they don't understand it, or they just don't understand. You cannot search in an unmarried mother's case by putting, like, like, by putting the names up. So we were talking about uh, unmarried mothers. In India, India is culturally totally different than other countries. Even some Asian countries are also uh, not having issues with unmarried mothers. But India is having. If you are having sexual relationship before marriage, then uh, you are done. Uh, no one will be married to you. Even if uh, somebody will spread word about you that you are having uh, relationships or affairs with uh, uh, XYZ before marriage, or then you are not going to get married. This is the situation and in such cases if you had a child without marriage and delivered that child and gave up and uh, most of the cases no, mm, girls are hiding these things, families are hiding these unwed mothers issue. No one knows exactly that uh, this woman delivered the child before marriage and then they are getting married to some other person and uh, having family, children from that man. And uh, after that, if you are going and knocking their door saying that, okay, hi, hello, I'm your child before marriage, then you can think what will happen to that woman. So that is the issue. Most of the cases, woman will be thrown from the house. Her life will be spoiled. Her children, especially if she's having girls, then those girls are not going to get married uh, in good houses or something like that. And uh, in some cases also, uh, these women were uh, forced to get married to such person who is alcoholic or who is not good or who is so abusive. So in these situations, these women are living with this such kind of man. And after that, you are going and knocking this woman's door is uh, like death of that woman, you can say. So this mother will have only some options, either you 
leave that man and live separately which is not going to happen in india so there is another option that you can commit suicide so whatever you want because when i am doing search it's really uh, secretive and discreetly i am doing that no one knows what i am doing in that area and uh, they, uh, so if as i arun told me that uh, they are having facebook network and friends and uh, volunteers i don't know how many them of knowing that how to go about it and if by mistake and they made a little mistake and it's disclosed so the mother's life is going to spoil even her children's life is going to spoil and the one gov for government or for this adoption agency they need only one case where you are spoiled that case and your rights to find out your mothers are going to be done so for me if you are doing it with volunteer network and facebook friends go ahead but uh, how you are going to be assured that your mother's life is going to be safe her privacy will be respected and uh, with all these situations uh, they will do this root search for this you that is need to be taken care thing means uh, for me means first mother's life is a issue and other thing if by mistake and uh, while ser searching that mother if we used some person locally so then your mother is going to be exploited might be financially might be physically and i don't know for what and how so these two things I mean exploitation is one part and uh, her life will be completely done with this search if you not do it discreetly and uh, respected her privacy um it's a, if we will talk about mistake uh, yeah at the beginning we also made some mistakes but uh, i handled those situations because i know uh, local people local language and everything and uh, there are i mean after searching mother if you are going to have a reunion you need to be really careful you need to prepare uh, adoptees as well as uh, biological parents too because uh, once you allowed direct communication or direct contact then our culture is different even today also i am also giving money to my mother and my mother also expects money from me so it's natural and normal even though they surrendered you in their vulnerable situation and knowing that you are doing well and you are in foreign country they will expect or neighbors or relatives can put in their mind that now uh, you can ask money because the families who surrender those children were in vulnerable situation poor and uh, not having good financial situation they are going to expect money from you and some cases uh, we saw that uh, adoption agency people uh, show the child that this is your mother and for 2 years this woman was exploiting that girl and this case came to me from uh, viral kindran only to find out if, if this woman is uh, this girl's uh, mother or not and i within 5 minutes i told her she is not the mother and then we found out the truth so you will be exploited you will be shown that this is your mother might be not a mother Uh, in our cases in our reunions and uh, our search cases we are always doing uh, dna uh, test and when dna is confirmed that this is the mother or biological relationship then only we are allowing uh, reunions otherwise we are not allowing them so the search of unwed mothers and reunions of unwed mothers is a really extremely difficult part which need to be handled by professional person who is having experience who knows the culture who knows the uh, how to handle the situation and how to handle the crisis uh, in such type type of case then only you can go ahead with this otherwise the volunteers and all i'm really scared of this that uh, doing such kind of thing you are going to uh, spoil other adoptees right to know about their biological families if you made a single mistake question is of course one can start building a car oneself but that's very complicated so <clears throat> i understand that many adoptees think okay if i travel to india i can go to the orphanage i get the information and then i can search 
Unfortunately, in most of the cases, it's not like that. And though there are some adoptees who actually managed in the first place, like going to the media and the media made a story and they found their mother. This is not the general rule. The general rule is as an adoptee, specifically when you're from, you know, the uh, orphanages where Werl Kinder worked with, Shishu uh, Sangopan, Grihar and Balanand, you will bang your head. So what Balanand will do, they will give you <laughs> Uh, first name of the mother and maybe the area. And then we have seen a lot of adoptees who travel again and again and again to India. And each travel to India, you can at least, you lose 2,500 euros at the very least with hotel, local travel and so on. If not more, because the mistake in calculation you make is that you're actually using your holiday and searching is not a holiday, it's very tough. And the holiday is actually paid for you by your employer that you actually can recover and have, you know, come back with more energy for work. So you are losing, in fact, that income. You, you have to calculate the working time which you are losing. So if you are working and pay us, it's much cheaper at the end of, of the day because most of the adoptees most of the Dutch adoptees, as we know, do not find back their parents, despite some expert, <laughs> experts giving guidance. Um, so I think when we unite and we build up together Adoptee Rights Council, and we have social workers in India who are actually doing this, <laughs> or professional, qualified, experienced people who are doing this for you, and th this is much cheaper at the end. The procedure it's very easy. You send us an, send us an email with your uh, information. We are going through that information. We will check whether we are able to solve the case, yes or no. We mostly cannot solve cases which where children are found things. And we really follow the paper trail. So once you we, we figure out that you are relinquished, so surrendered child, we are able to tr most likely able to trace the family based on the paper trail. So you send us the paperwork, we will see whether you're a founding, whether you're a relinquished child, and then we will set up a video call, an intake call, and I will explain to the adoptees, and we actually search thereafter. We make a contract, make a power of attorney, and we search until we found the mother or the family, and we try to take DNA always, that's our goal, we can't enforce it, but we try to take a DNA test, uh, sample and we'll send it to you or send it directly to FTDNA and uh, we we'll wait for the result and then you come to India for the reunion. We will be there, our social workers Anjali will be there with you for the reunion and also we will be there a little bit afterwards, um, you know, to help you overcome the culture. We are though very careful, we don't give the information out before the reunion because we have made very bad experiences with that and mostly this doesn't turn out well for the adoptees as well nor for the families <coughs> when there are some misunderstandings. We are also very careful in the communication. I understand that adoptees want immediately over WhatsApp contact with their families. We are making this slow. We are asking the adoptees to come here, have a reunion, be comfortable with us, with themselves, then of course they are connected and then we are still there if something goes wrong in the communication. So we do this very professional. Uh, Chennai, we are filing uh, a court case uh, regarding the agencies which are closed down and uh, not maintained record. We are asking uh, court to order to Department of Women and Child Development to have a hold on all those files and take a position of those files, archive them and make sure that adoptees will be uh, served with their rights to know their biological families and uh, I hope yeah, that yeah, that is another part. So I hope that uh, means many organizations are closed down long back and people died and no one is there. So somewhere, somehow they will search all those documents. And other thing is uh, we ask for uh, India based DNA database because I don't want or wish to give 
Indian DNA in foreign countries DNA database. So, we also requesting uh, court to order regarding create a DNA database of missing children and with the families whose children went missing. So, let them come forward, give their DNAs to Indian DNA database. So, at least if adoptees will put their DNA somewhere, somehow it will be, if it will be matched, it will be more easier to connect with the families. The two things we asked from Chennai, uh, Madras High Court. Yeah. Our successes are that we actually reunited 52 adult adoptees and that in this very hostile environment. The absolute success is of course that we are no longer third party and we are allowed now to search. The, um, it is also a real success that all but one orphanage in Maharashtra actually cooperate and collaborate with Anjali and we are going to get the information. It is an absolute success, also we had a lot of fight with the missionaries of charity, that they actually agree to co collaborate with Anjali. So we are getting access to these files. This is, what more do we want? Of course I understand adoptees want the e files to be emailed, but that's not, ain't gonna happen. So this is the best we can get for right now. Um, I want to show one video, uh, show it in full length, which was made by the Hindustan Times. This is one, it's a very nice video about Anusha Kroon. Some have seen it maybe, but I just want to show it again. I'm just hoping that I will be able to see my mother. I've never been so excited in my life. <laughs> I recognize so much more in, in her body, the small wrists the long fingers I got from her, the eyes. And I said, she's uh, your daughter. She said, yes, I got it. I'm feeling very happy to be here finally after a long year of waiting and so much insecurity. I'm finally about to go back to where I came from. I'm still not expecting, I'm just hoping that I will be able to see my mother after a long, long time of not having seen her. This is a very special trip because I feel different than the previous times I came to India. It just makes me happy to see that my wife's scared, that, that she's happy and that she feels like she belongs. And then we were looking at pictures in our old, in old photo albums. Our adoptive father that said, well actually you look a bit like the woman in the picture. And I think that was one of the triggers. <laughs> We're good at forgetting things. We don't have to double-check Before I want to become a mother, I couldn't become a mother without finding mine first. Because now I can show my children, here's your Indian grandmother. You're having her eyes too and smile and this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this portion is like your mother, yeah. your eyes, color. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Up until today, I, I still wake up every day and, and I, I do this like <laughs> they found her, she's still alive and she's okay. I found her out last time I met her. Now it's going to be a reunion, so it's going to be really difficult as uh, when she had. Anusha, that time she was uh, widowed and uh, in their community no one knows about it. Even though I lived for 27 years at the other side of the world, I still lived one year of my life here, so to be here again and to, to see everything I finished up my work and all of a sudden I see an email coming in. 
and Mela actually says, well, actually, Anjali has found her mother. We clicked on it and then suddenly there was a whole picture and it was like, like I was looking in the mirror and seeing myself in 30, 40 years. For me it was not necessary that she knew who I was. I just wanted to have an image of her. And so if I see her this week and it won't be in the open like it is often in TV shows and everything, but in my heart I know I'm your daughter and she will know she's my daughter and that's enough for me. So, you excited? Yes, I've never been so excited in my life. <laughs> I'm going to the place where my mother is. <laughs> Just nearby, and there might be 10 15 kilometers. So, in 10 15 kilometers, we'll be there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we are going to start from here only asking some questions because we are seeing some old women. Yeah. So, I want this rumor to spread. So, if, if anybody says, oh, why they came to our village only? So, no, no, no. They asked us question too. And blah, 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 blah. It gets real, more real. Yeah, more real and... Uh, yeah. She's having uh, this knee problem and this is the problem. Malaka, right? Malaka, what do you do? No, I'm crazy. What do you do? Go to the house. Go to the house. I said, I when I said, you remember me? She said, yes, I remember you. Yeah. And I said, she is uh, your daughter. She said, yes, I got it. Because she saw your face, na? She was looking at your face constantly. Yeah. So she realized... Yeah, the yeah. first five minutes and you, you <laughs> told you her after when we were alone, I was so mm. I, I recognized it. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's always happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> I have like cotton and I have like stove from a stove. I feel happy. Of course, also a bit sad at the same time. There is a whole room full of cotton. I mean, I've wondered about a house for years and I was hoping she had a house at least and she has one. And The small wrists I got from her, the long fingers I got from her, the long neck, the chin, the nose, of course, the eyes. The most important thing of this journey was to know she was still alive and she's a strong woman and I will keep that in mind and in heart whatever the world will throw at me I will manage because today I saw the example of a strong woman Oh, 
One question is always, I understand, we should work for free and everything should be for free. But nothing in this world is for free. So we need money to travel. We need also money to eat ourselves. In 2018, I was very clear about, and I also explained that I'm actually moving to India to get this project running, to get this organization running, which is an organization and the office is actually from you. So it's for the adoptees. We, we also have to fight with the Ministry of Justice, for example, or the Ministry in, in Belgium. And we need to tell them also what is really needed for, what are the costs really for searches. And as you imagine, you know, I put all my life into it and I also put all my money and all resources into it. ACT was previously largely financed by the fact that I received unemployment money and then I got a little bit money from, you know, from ACT and my adoptive parents backed me up and of course Rudy Post actually put a lot of money in. And yeah, we got some donations, but this is how, and I didn't really get paid. So this is, this is how we actually financed the work all these years. I'm very glad if others think that's just a hobby and they can do it as a sideline. Maybe I'm stupid, maybe, but I can't do it. I couldn't do it on a sideline just against a full job. Uh, it's a full-time job. So I promise I go to India and I will not take a salary when we actually are uniting. What happened in 2018 that, you know, some people know we got heavily, 2017, 2018, and still today, we're getting heavily defamed, which undermines our work. I want to be transparent about the finances we have, actually. When you see, I mean, I'm going to show the records of 2019, because last year records are just a mess, <laughs> we couldn't also do something and we had some more donations, but this does not reflect a working year. So a working year is 2019 and we got, allowed, um, we got about 11,000 euros in donation. Um, so this could, be, this could be, we could actually work on getting more donations. When you see Panther cells, these are actually all, all money from adoptees, which actually adoptees pay to us either via the adoptive, into the Adoptee Solidarity Fund, if they're unmarried mother cases, or if they already have the name, then you know, we work on 200 euros per day, or if they are foundlings, we work for 200 euros per day. So this is the gross income. So we had in 2019 almost 70,000 euros in, uh, um, in income. <clears throat> then we had the expenses, yeah. Actual expenses, 26,000. We had consultancy fee, that's the money Anjali actually gets. So, though, in part, you know, there are also partially sometimes expenses. And it's a daily allowance, this is actually what I got. And that there's also sometimes uh, actually expenses in. Um, in this we, we don't have that much office rent in 2019. We didn't have that office here, we had an office down. So we had expenses of 62,000. So um, I do not get a salary. So I do have money, of course, I take an allowance out of it and I'm doing fine, so that's not the issue. But the plan was different that I actually moved back to Germany and you know, in, in some way and I need a salary. And um, you can w work for an organization or, um, on an allowance for a while, but not like I'm doing. So that is also not correct, <laughs> because in the Netherlands you actually have a minimum wage. But since I'm a director, I can try suing myself for underpaying me, but I'm underpaid. And I do not feel, I do not feel, I personally do not feel valued uh, by the community that I actually do this work um, more or less unpaid properly. I don't have savings for pensions and things like that. <laughs> um, and also, Right now, no health insurance, no things like that. So you can all say, you can do this for free, I can't. And the question is, what do we need as an organization? We need double the amount. So we need as an organization around 150,000 euros. Then yes, I'm going to take out a salary, small <laughs> things, and we can actually employ more social workers in India, train them and employ them, and have a bigger, bigger setup. Then the costs, per case, once we actually have more cases, yeah, the cost per case will go down. So the question is, how do we get between 70,000 and 150,000 euros? If you are saying to the Ministry of Justice that I'm overcharging and you can do it cheaper, we will never get there. If you guys are saying, I should also get do the fundraising, I can't do everything. 
So this is why I'm saying, um, this is why I'm saying, help us with fundraising, help us building the organization. In return, we are going to find back your parents. There are many ways of doing it. I have, I, I mean, the Adoptee Solidarity Fund, I can actually change. I could actually go down, since we are now getting easier access to the files, thanks to the adoptees who actually all contributed. The adoptees who didn't do will now benefit from it if I put the price down, okay? So I can put the price down maybe to 7,000 euros something, separate, um, spread over three, three years. This only works if we have more cases, and works because I'm spreading it over three years, yeah? So it works only if I have more cases, <laughs> have more staff, and we really unite. So if I have now competitors who are saying they can do it for a few hundred euros, for which we actually re need real money, then I'm going to go down. Then I'm also not going being able to um, lower the price. Um, we can discuss this. We can discuss this. Um, I promise you, as community, if I have you know expression of interest from I mean serious expressions of interest from adoptees that they say they will actually search with us if we lower the price to seven thousand, I will lower the price. But I need really, 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 really these um, clear cut promises that you are going to search with us. Then I'm lowering the lower, going to lower the price. Otherwise. You know, it's very simple to, to it's very simple to calculate. We have we have as an organization we have to calculate the um, budget we need through the cases we have, as long as there's no other funding. Okay, so it's very simple calculation. It's actually the same way as adoption agencies uh, calculate. And yes, it's perverse. Yes, it's perverse that adoptees have to pay. But we are also being, and along with other organizations, we are also fighting with, also we are fighting also with other organizations that we are getting funding from the governments of the receiving countries, not only the Netherlands, but we have been fighting in Belgium without success. We are fighting in Denmark, trying to do this in Sweden, and so on. So the current Adoptee Solidarity Fund is that adoptees, where we think we can solve the cases, and who come to us without knowing the name and address of the mother that we ask 2,500 euros and 200 euros per month and that over seven years. If we cannot find the identifying information, the adoptee can stop. If we cannot solve the case within three years, the adoptees can stop. And only the seven, the seven years are only there if we are successful. Now, there are a lot of rumors on the internet that I'm very rich because, you know, it's 20,000 euros if you add it up, but the 20,000 euros are over seven years. So, when I have 10 cases, I have only 25,000 euros per year. Okay, so no, it's not 25,000 plus uh, yeah, 12 times 200 uh, uh, euros multiplied by 10. I mean, it's, I'm not rich. The calculation and the rumors on the internet are Arun sol uh, is Arun solved 52 cases. Remember the beginning, in the beginning I didn't even charge, I paid myself. So the 52 cases multiplied by 220,000, two, two so I'm a millionaire according to that calculation. So such is the discrepancy of reality and what actually people tell about our organization. Yeah. Thank you for watching this video and I'll be very glad if you join the Zoom session. We will have much more deeper discussion also about the financial aspects. I'm also open for ideas from your side. I mean, of course, we, I'm very open to new ideas. And we will also, of course, answer even more detailed questions. So it's about a bit like a question and answer too. And you can also bring your own experience in if you want. So it's an open, relatively open, um, yeah, it's a relatively open meeting.